Hi, welcome to Songs for Our Temple and This Week at Little Hills. I'm Melanie, and today we're going to be looking at Psalms 109, 110, and 111. And Psalm 109, uh, this is one of those imprecatory psalms where it sounds very violent. This is one of those, this is one of the uh, harshest ones, I think. Um, now, you might be thinking, why are there things like this in the Bible? This, this psalm talks about wanting death for your enemies. And aren't we supposed to forgive our enemies? This is the Bible. God is love. We, we're supposed to love one another. How does this fit in? This seems awfully harsh. Well, we, we're going to take a look at this. Um, now, this is part of scripture, these imprecatory psalms. Uh, th these were given to us for a reason. Um, it's scripture, it's God-breathed, so it is useful for us. So let's take a closer look at Psalm 109. And there's an interesting fact about this psalm. Uh, this Verse 8 of this psalm is quoted in Acts 120 about Judas, uh, where it talks about let another take his office. So we, we do see reference to this in the New Testament also. Um, so like I was saying, parts of this psalm seem extremely harsh, uh, verses 8 and 9. Here's a little sample. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Verse 13, it says, may his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. So there's a few things to note about this psalm in particular, but the imprecatory psalms in general. These are not actions. These kind of psalms, this is a prayer to God. It's not the writer of this psalm is not going out and doing these things and taking vengeance for themselves. Vengeance belongs to God, not to us. Because when we do take action for ourselves, when we're judging others and taking action against them, then we're taking a power that doesn't belong to us. That's not for us to do. Um, so we need to also, we need to keep our own sinfulness in mind when we read these and when we pray th these kinds of prayers, when we're praying about our enemies and people that have wronged us, which we do. I mean, it, it's, it takes a lot of maturity to be able to look at someone who's wronged us and go, I want nothing but good things for you. I, I pray that God will bless you. That's, that's hard. Um, but when we keep our own sinfulness in mind and our own standing before God and what he's done for us. That, that gets a lot easier. Um, so, so point number one, the, the author was asking God for help, not doing it himself. Um, point number two, the, the wicked man in this particular psalm, uh, he was actively trying to destroy the people of God. The, the writer was writing on behalf of the powerless and the weak. So this person, they described him a little bit in this psalm. He was, he cursed others. He knowingly accused others who were innocent. So the person writing this psalm didn't actually do anything wrong, but th this evil person was accusing them. And it says that, uh, that this person pursued the poor and needy and brokenhearted to put them to death. So this isn't just a person who messed up and cut somebody off in traffic. This is a, a evil person. Uh, the next point, uh, this was written under the Old Covenant. Uh, so God's people at this time were the physical nation of Israel. There are some things in there that we see in the Old Covenant that don't necessarily carry over into our day. Um, they, they were told to conquer their enemies, and their mission was to uphold the law and to provide that they were sort of the kingdom of God on earth, and that was their mission. And they were to keep the covenant. It was very tangible. There were animal sacrifices that had to be made. Um, but our mission now, under the new covenant, under God's grace and under the redemption of Jesus, um, our mission now is to spread the gospel. Our, Jesus told us that we're, we're to love others, we're to share his good news, and we're to love and pray for our enemies. So that that is for us. We, we are... We are not in the same circumstances as the writer of this psalm. And my next point, uh, point number four here, uh, our enemies are spiritual. It's important to remember that our enemies are not flesh and blood. 
there is evil in the world. Now, one of the words that they that the writer uses for this wicked man in this psalm is the word accuser, because it says that he's accusing him. And it's the same Hebrew word that we use to translate the word Satan, because he's our accuser. And that's kind of that's the same root that that word comes from. And uh, which I thought was interesting that it just kind of furthers the, the idea that this is there's more to this fight than just the physical. And as it says in Ephesians six twelve, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We're absolutely at war, but our enemy is not a person. We're to see people as God's children and image bearers of God. He's created them and he loves them and they're in need of his grace. So when, when we acknowledge that we have an enemy, we need to keep in mind that it's not the person who's doing the bad things. It's our ultimate enemy. It's the spiritual forces. So the bottom line of the imprecatory Psalms in general, and especially Psalm 109, uh, is that there will be justice for the persecuted. And this, this Psalm made me think of Revelation 6, 9 and 10. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And the answer that was given to them was that they must rest a little longer. But their voice was heard, and all will be made right by God at the final judgment. So God does see the suffering of his people when they're oppressed and persecuted. And as believers, we absolutely can be oppressed and persecuted in, in all sorts of different ways, but sometimes very tangible and physical ways. And God is a God of love and mercy, but he's also a God of justice. We can rest assured that he hears us and that all will be made right. Psalm 110 Wow, this psalm, I love this psalm. It, it always gives me goosebumps. So this is a messianic psalm, and it's talking about the, the king. And there are several of these psalms in the book of Psalms where it has kind of two layers to it. There's the layer that's talking about the current king of Israel, whoever that might be, uh, David or Solomon or the, the actual physical king. And then in a lot of those psalms, there's this other layer that can't be fulfilled in a flesh and blood person at that time. It's looking forward to the Messiah. And uh, the, this, this particular Psalm though, Psalm 110 is almost exclusively about the Messiah. There's not really much in here that applies to the, the king at that time, but it's, it's this really cool little glimpse into this vision that David has of the future Messiah. And uh, it, it's, it gets fully fulfilled in the book of Revelation and that image that we see of Jesus there, of the victorious king. Uh, and verse one should sound very familiar. This one is been, it was quoted by Jesus. And here's verse one. It says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is the verse that Jesus quoted to the Pharisees. When, when he asks them who they think the Messiah is. And they say, he's the son of David. So that they kind of got it, but not completely. Uh, so Jesus uses it to show how the Messiah is even greater than David. He's not just the son of David because David is calling him Lord. And generally, if you're the king, you don't call your future descendant Lord. So he, he was making the point that the Messiah is more than just a descendant of David. So continuing in Psalm 110 to talk about the, the then future Messiah, verse four, one of my favorites, it says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So uh, just in case you, you're not familiar, Melchizedek is kind of a, kind of a crazy name if you're not familiar with that story. Um, that's back in Genesis chapter 14. In the time of Abraham. So this is way back before the nation of Israel. This is Abraham. 
And uh, Melchizedek, his name means king of righteousness, which I thought was kind of cool. And he's literally, the character of Melchizedek, he's literally the king of Salem, uh, which at that time, that was what Jerusalem was called. But Salem is a word that means peace. So he's the king of righteousness and the king of peace, which, you know, kind of, that sounds very parallel to the Lord. So we, we have this person way back thousands of years ago who kind of parallels what, what Jesus, who Jesus is a little bit in some ways here. Uh, so he was called the priest of God most high. And this was before there were even Levites. There was no Israel yet. Uh, Abraham offered, this, there was a war and Abraham offered a 10th of the spoils to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek brought out some bread and wine, which I thought, I thought again, some parallels there for them to have together. And then Melchizedek blessed Abraham and he kind of sent him on his way. And if you're interested in hearing more about him, uh, the author of Hebrews kind of expands this parallel in Hebrews chapter seven. So if you don't already haven't read that, I would highly encourage it. It's very interesting. So that's Psalm 110, this, this awe-inspiring picture of the Messiah. Psalm 111, and this one, it, it's kind of a companion psalm to Psalm 112, which we'll be looking at next week. But um, this is a psalm that praises God for his mighty works for his people. And it, it talks about remembering the covenant and his precepts, which is the law, and his inheritance, which is the promised land. So Psalm 111, it's just a little short, kind of short psalm. It's an acrostic poem which um, what, what it does with that is it takes a letter of the Hebrew alphabet and each line starts with the, the, new, the next letter. Um, I thought that was, that's kind of neat. There are a few different reasons why the psalmist use that kind of thing. One of them is to help people remember it because it's just easier to remember when, when we have a kind of a mnemonic device like that. But um, I, I thought it kind of was interesting because it, it's further proof that God is glorified and human artistic creation, which it's not entirely human. It's the word of God. It's breathed by the Holy Spirit. But I, I think literary devices can honor God, just like art and music and the things that he has created us capable to be capable of doing. He's the creator and he's made us in his image. Um, but the theme of Psalm 111, um, I, I felt like it was kind of summed up in verse two, where it says, great are the words of the Lord, works of the Lord, sorry, studied by all who delight in them. And then it goes on to talk about God's works towards his covenant people of Israel. So it says, great are the works of the Lord and studied by all those who delight in him. So previous to this, we've got the word of God and it's talking all about the works of God, his covenant, his people, his law. And it's important to study those things because if, if we love something, we're going to want to learn more about it. And it, that's kind of what verse two says. And then it goes through and it lists off um, a lot of the, the works of God towards his people. Um, at five times it uses the word forever, which I thought that was, that was interesting. It's just this really short 22 line poem. And it talks about God's righteousness endures forever. He remembers his covenant forever. His precepts are established forever. He commanded his covenant forever in connection with redemption of his people. And his praise endures forever. And I, I, I thought that was just really good, just to keep in mind, and we should never forget it. We should write it on, on our hearts and remember it daily. And at the end of Psalm 111, it just kind of leads right into Psalm 112 by saying, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Because then Psalm 112 continues to go with the theme of wisdom and the, the godly man after talking about God's works. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, don't forget, we have on Monday evening, uh, the next in the series on Steadfast. And uh, also on Sunday evenings, we've been meeting in person at, at our location on Drossy Road. And, uh, and we've, we'd love to see you there at 5.30 p.m. on Sunday. And thank you very much for joining us. Have a blessed week.